Welcome to another show of this week. In our first story, Education Minister calls for schools to be zones of peace and also calls for the enrollment into schools of more female students. He was speaking at an event to mark the International Day of the Girl Child, which brought together students from different schools. The day also marked the National Girls Education Day. Here is the story. For those students, dodgeball games, locally known as Boruburu, ruled their hallways and fields, at the same time uniting them within their school learning environments. And as they marked the International Day of the Girl, while showcasing their best game, the Education Minister Deng Deng Hock announced that the budget allocation to the education sector had been increased by more than 150%. Deng Deng says this increase to the national education budget will be used to improve standards for schools nationally and also cater for out-of-school children, especially girls. We have increased our share of funding to education by 150, more than 150 percent. Yes, we are doing so because we are acutely aware that education needs more investment. And with more investment, we can tackle the problems in education, including the problem of access for the 1.8 million children who are out of school. Highlighting the plight of the girl child, the minister said that their numbers had risen, though gender purity in schools had not been reached. The number of girls has risen from around just a quarter of a million in 2012 to about half a million in 2015. This is a massive jump, but we should not be complacent. If the parents can cooperate with us, we will triple the figures to 1.5 million within five years. In so doing, we bring the gender parity to one to one. This is vitally important. If we are to achieve gender equality and empower women uh, and girls in this country and elsewhere in the world. Speaking at the same event, a UNICEF official highlighted concerns affecting the girl child's enrollment. In South Sudan, more than 51% of school age children are estimated to be out of school. And only 35% of girls are enrolled at primary level. Data indicates that the burden of household work on girls coupled with early marriage has culminated into unequal participation of girls in education and has perpetuated a gender disparity. This means we have to exert efforts to get girls ready for school by enrolling them into ECD, retaining them through primary and secondary school level so that they can qualify for entry into higher educational institutions. With partners in the education sector being aware of many of the issues affecting learning for girls, more investment including access for the 1.8 million who are out of school, a significant number of them being girls, will be put into ensuring a gender purity in schools countrywide. At the event, which was marked on October 11th at Juba Girls Secondary School, the minister separately pleaded that schools need to be safe and peaceful areas. Make a school a zone of peace. When each school becomes a zone of peace, we will have a conducive learning environment in which every child feels safe and teaching and learning can take place without disruptions, without distractions, without any other problems that will make it hard or difficult for anybody to learn. 
conflict in South Sudan has resulted in many schools closing, with some students abandoning their studies. A school cannot function in the middle of a war zone when people are fighting. Therefore, we need to promote a culture of peace in this country. Every one of us, whether you are a youth, a child, a woman, a man, all of us, the citizens of this country and our friends who are living in this country. It is our collective responsibility. We must all work together to ensure peace continue to prevail. Because in the context of peace, then we can embark on development and development is what is going to bring prosperity for everybody. With this National Police for Peace and with the commitment for more enrollment of girls, the international slogan marking this year's International Day of the Girl, which is Girls Progress equals Girls Progress, may indeed make a difference because all girls count just like the dodgeball games locally known as Boruboru game. In our next story, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir tours the capital of Juba and assures citizens of his commitment to peace. Here is the story. After touring various locations in Juba town in an open motorcade on Wednesday afternoon, South Sudan's President Salva Kiir called on the country to remain calm. This appeal for calm came after rumors about his death. I am alive and well, and uh, I want to assure my people of South Sudan and all the friends that what they had last night and this morning were all fabrications by the enemies of peace. They want to derail peace. And as you have seen before, people were running away from their, from their businesses. And by leaving your shop unguarded, some people will get themselves there to loot because this was the purpose of creating such a Roma, to scare people so that they run away and people go back to their shops to take whatever they want to take. During his speech, President Kiir sent his condolences to relatives of victims of recent bus attacks that claimed lives along the Juba Yei and Juba Nimule roads. I warn everybody to remain calm. As for the parents and the relatives of the victims who lost their lives, in these tragic incidents, I want to calm them down by telling them that let them remain calm. And nobody should take the law into his or her own hands to go and revenge. It is no time for revenging. It is time for forgiveness. Even if we get them today, those who kill the people, we can still forgive them. Because they don't know what they are doing. The president said he would not accept a return to war. There are people also who want you know, this peace to break down. So that you know they they go people go back to war, but we will not accept. This country has suffered for a very long time, and we will not accept any more fighting. If uh, there are such elements still <coughs> among us, still doing their job in between us, it will be a matter of time but we will handle them. 
Dismissing tribalism, President Kiru said that South Sudanese solidly fought a common enemy together. We fought the war, very long war, and a very terrible war. And that they knew, they do not we were not fighting as tribes. We organized ourselves into a guerrilla army, and we fought our common enemy together. I think nothing will take us away from that line. I fought as a nationalist, fighting for the liberation of South Sudan. I cannot come and turn today to become a tribal leader. After the death of Sudan's first vice president, Dr. John Garang, in mid-2005, Southern Sudanese chose President Salva Kiir as his successor. In an election years later in April 2010, President Kiir was voted leader of the then Southern Sudan and immediately appointed as first vice president of Sudan according to an interim constitution. President Kiir has remained at the helm of South Sudan's leadership since the country gained its independence on July 9, 2011. In our next piece, First Vice President Taban Deng, who led a delegation to the United Nations General Assembly in New York, returns to the country. We caught up with his delegation at the airport. Here is the story. Speaking to journalists at Juba International Airport on Wednesday afternoon, Petroleum Minister said the delegation which represented the government at the UN General Assembly had a chance to speak about the future of South Sudan and a way forward for the troubled nation. The mission was successful. Uh, in a nutshell, all the leaders that we have uh, met, uh, they have messages for the people of South Sudan. Uh, message number one is that they support the President of the Republic. They are standing with the President of the Republic, General Salfa Kiir Mayadid, and the whole leadership in South Sudan. Message number two is to implement the agreement. Uh, this agreement is an internationally recognized agreement. The grantors are also uh, here in the region and beyond. They want us to implement this agreement. Message number three is, uh, is that when you have an agreement implemented, the whole world will be supporting you. He said various leaders they had bilateral talks with expressed their full support for the country. We have a lot of goodwill uh, internationally. And that's why uh, South Sudan is always an issue. It is a topic to be discussed in the UN and also in the international bodies. We, we were so excited and happy and the first Vice President of the Republic of South Sudan was very, very excited and happy uh, on behalf of his president, representing him in New York, to get all those messages directly from the world leaders. He said the world leaders called on South Sudanese to implement the agreement and work together. Uh, mission was uh, accomplished. We are here uh, to start uh, the work of building this new nation. Of course, another message from the, from the world leaders is that you, South Sudanese, while you are implementing the agreement, you must unite, you must reconcile, you must work together. Uh, it is your country, it is you uh, to address all the issues, and the world is supporting us. Uh, the president, the first vice president, the vice president, James Wanega, and the whole cabinet, and the people of South Sudan will be supported by the world. You should not worry that uh, there are rumors that are flying around that uh, we are being discussed in the UN and uh, things are going to be uh, very gloomy. No, the world is fully with us. The world is fully with us and we are moving to make sure that the world is mobilized to even, even support us more and more in terms of development uh, and also uh, helping us to reconcile quickly. 
Addressing the 71st session of the General Assembly, First Vice President Abandeng told the Assembly that South Sudan had, quote, consented to the UN Security Council Resolution 2304 in order to avoid derailing national healing and reconciliation. Resolution 2304 allows for a deployment of a 4,000 strong regional protection force to South Sudan. Our next item highlights a cordial meeting between the United Nations Mission in South Sudan and close to 30 traditional chiefs representing various states countrywide. They are calling for peace and unity and reconciliation at the national level. Up next is the report. At a meeting with officials from the UN Mission Civil Affairs Division, Political Affairs Division and Communication and Public Information Office, the traditional chiefs who represent different ethnic groups in the country call for peace and reconciliation. The traditional leaders said they are committed to engaging actively to heal divisions and unify the country. They said dialogue with the United Nations was also important. <laughs> At the meeting, the director of civil affairs at ANMIS, Guang Song, said ANMIS will continue to support peace and reconciliation initiatives. There is this urgent need for all of us to work together to repair this to restore the social cohesion. So now, can I invite the chiefs? The, the floor is yours, and we'll be very happy to hear the, whatever you have. And I hope that it is kind of two-way dialogue. And if you have any issues that you want to bring our attention, we will be more than happy to hear. At the same time, on my part, we would be very happy to hear you from you how to promote the peace and reconciliation among the communities, because that is one of the most challenging issues facing the country now. In late July and months that followed, the chiefs led hundreds of protesters saying they objected to a deployment of regional protection forces to the country. They have now vowed to work in collaboration with ANMIS to promote its mandate and have also approved the deployment of the Regional Protection Force to South Sudan, reversing an earlier decision against its deployment. I am Philip Wani, reporting for this week. Following up in our next piece, a representative of South Sudan Civil Alliance has endorsed the deployment of a regional protection force, which they were earlier opposed to. The representative was speaking to Radio Mirai's Democracy in Action on Monday. Why did it take you long, or your organization, Civil Society Alliance, to accepting the resolution uh, of UN Security Council for the deployment of 4,000 force to Juba? We thought South Sudan is not different from other countries around the world in which people create government to protect their lives and properties. And therefore, the protection of the civilian lives and the entire population and their properties is the sole responsibility of the government of the day. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we felt like this is the job, that's why SPLA was created police and national security and other organized forces. Why should we involve other foreign troops while we have this troop? Unless if they say you know, that they are not capable of depending the nation. Of course, I understand that insecurity is a grave alarming issue in the country. And therefore, after having understood and we set as the leadership of the civil society, we came to the conclusion that we must welcome the protection force of 4,000. Of course, our concern was that why should they only focus in Cuba? 
So we came to the conclusion, and I want to make it clear, UN is not a problem to, the, to, our, to our country. UN is not a problem to the, is not even involved directly in the current crisis that we are facing. In the state, they are helping. One of your concerns was earlier about the sovereignty. Now, so can you explain how, how is that being uh, addressed? The sovereignty is addressed by getting a hand from other friends and region who are coming to help us. They are not going to, they are not coming to invade because the, the government gave them a consent. And I have a communicate here. The, when the government came out clearly and said that they were going to cooperate with the with the deployment of the force, and then the following, uh, I think, day or week, you also made a statement again, repeating your position to rejecting uh, again the 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 the, the, um, the 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 force. And so it seems like really this is a, a change of directions, like 160 degree. We are having in this country a representative democracy where we have elected members of parliament and the president to go and represent us. If you feel like you are not represented enough, you have a, you have a right to voice your concern. And when there is common ground where you think as a citizen that the, the, the action taken by the government is on your side, of course you must follow. So that wouldn't make us to be different. I'm not, I don't work for the government. And I want to show it here to the nine community that we are different. Of course, the government was clear, saying that they will not accept even single soldier. The president say that, and and so it is. Seems like okay. So this is the mantra or the song, and it was kind of you are clearly on that. So it wasn't sort of a kind of independent position on your side. There's no way you, you can bring foreign troop without agreement of the government. That will be an invasion. Now that the government understood, they have accepted. And we have also shared our concern with them mm -hmm. and with the UN. We felt that we were, we were satisfied with the, with, the, with, the, with the meeting and therefore uh, we, we should welcome the citizen, uh, I mean the, the protection force. And apart from this, who want the protection? Not the government. Of course not the 4,000. But our bodyguard, the real bodyguard, is understanding between us as citizens. We must forgive each other. We must reconcile. And that's why we believe by that. That if you bring a million soldiers, will not solve the problem. In civil society, we denounce Biden. We are against Biden. We don't believe in any military option that can be a solution for any conflict in the country just briefly to, to wind up your thoughts on this uh, on this uh, of, of when is it indeed this force uh, is going to come as you said also the violence is all picking up in this country the coming of uh, 4000 is connected with the modalities to be played by the uh, to be done by the government there is a communicate between the government and UNIMIS that the government by end of September suppose to give the modalities and how these troops are going to be deployed. So it depends with the government. In our next piece, Japan pledges to continue its support towards peacekeeping operations in South Sudan. Here is what we filed. Japanese Defense Minister Tomomi Inada made this commitment while on a visit to South Sudan. The Japanese government last year approved a new law expanding the role of the Japanese military saving in the peacekeeping missions beyond engineering and logistical work. Under the slogan of proactive contribution to peace proposed by the Abe administration, we will continue to contribute to peace and stability for South Sudan, Africa and all over the world. Minister Tomomi met with UN Special Representative Ellen Magri Lodge to discuss her country's role in UN peacekeeping operations. 
Japan currently has 350 engineers serving under the UN mission in South Sudan. Special Representative Ellen Lloyd commended Japan on their contribution to UNMIS and appeal for continued support. Well, I appeal to the minister not to forget South Sudan and the mission. So I hope very much that Japan will continue to contribute with an engineering company to the mission, but I also took the liberty of appealing to the Honorable Minister that Japan continue their development work with South Sudan because the South Sudanese people really need it. Special Representative Anna Loy said she commended Japan on their contribution to UNMIS and appeal for continued support. The minister also met with the government officials to discuss the possibility of resuming development projects that were suspended on the onset of fighting in July. Speaking through an interpreter, the minister described it her short visit as fruitful. It was a very fruitful visit as I was able to meet with various ministers from the government of South Sudan as well as the SRSG and was able to exchange our views on the situation of South Sudan. Tomomi said she is happy and motivated with what the Japanese contingent have been doing in South Sudan. Especially, I am very happy to hear that the government officials, the SRSG and local residents are grateful about the roads that the Japanese contingent has fixed and the facilities that they have built and I am also very proud that the Japanese troops are highly motivated and have been working very hard. Inada, who was in the country for seven hours, stressed on Japan's commitment to continue to support on peace and stability in South Sudan. Following up and to end our show is our usual Voices of Peace. Goodbye for now and join us again next week. Even though my country is in difficulties, I cannot deny this. I feel great. Because when you take refuge in another country, they mistreat you because they know that you are not a native of that country. But here in my country, even though we are having these conflicts and this crisis, economic hardship, I know that one, one day there will be a change and we will enjoy our country. My message of this is how we should put down guns and deadly weapons because time for violence has fast. This time here is for new generation to enjoy peace in their country. This is no longer time for Anyanya 1 or Anyanya 2, but we want to enjoy the fruit of struggle. I really wanted to be in a peaceful environment and enjoy our education without more conflicts in the country. <laughs>